Welcome, Mr. Craig, to Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes. Thank you. Um, so this is our first Gold Star uh, family interview. Mm -hmm. And the Honor Cafe wanted to um, do tributes to the Gold Star families, and we couldn't think of a, a better first tribute than to talk about Brian, your son. Mm, thank you. So before we start, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, for 44 years, I was pastor of a deaf church here in Houston and uh, we uh, were connected with Houston's First Baptist Church and uh, we uh, had missions overseas and working with the deaf in Ukraine and Russia and all over the U.S. and uh, uh, we uh, shared the gospel wherever we went. So when uh, did uh, Brian enter service? Well, uh, you know, he, when he was like in the 10th grade, he uh, had a real desire to join the military. I didn't think too much about it then, but found out that he had a, um, a school teacher that was real patriotic, and he instilled in Brian a, a desire to go in the military. Well, it ended up that Brian had a full uh, scholarship to go to A&M, but he turned that, that down to uh, go in the military. And uh, so, when he graduated from uh, high school, he went directly into the Army. And uh, he wanted to go into airborne infantry. And I tried to discourage him to do something else so he would, could get out later and uh, get a job. And, uh, but uh, he was determined to go in the military. And, and he said, Dad, I want you to support me in this. So uh, we did. <clears throat> and uh, he was in airborne infantry for about, uh, well, the first four years he was in the Army. And uh, then he came, he called me one day from um, Alaska and said, uh, uh, Dad, I'm, I'm getting out of airborne infantry. And I said, what are you going to be doing now? And I said, praise the Lord, <laughs> getting out of airborne infantry. And uh, he said, uh, well, I'm going into EOD. And I had no idea what EOD was. I said, what is that? And he said, well, it's, um, it's a bomb tech, and we dismantle bombs, and it's a bomb squad, and, and uh, we go into all kinds of situations, and of course, Afghanistan and uh, all the other places that we had troops where they need EOD bomb techs. And uh, so that's how he ended up. After four and a half years, he left um, that part of the Army and, and, and volunteered to be an EOD uh, tech. Where, where was he sent first? Well, uh, he uh, was in San Diego uh, for a while, and then he was, uh, he was sent to Afghanistan after that. Did and, he, uh you mentioned uh, the last time we talked, he also had a tour in Korea as well. Uh, yeah, he, he after he had been in a while, he, he came home on, on leave one time, and, uh, and he was telling me about this special mission in uh, Korea. And uh, he said, I really want to go. He said, it's a great, great job. And he, I said, what do you be doing? And he said, well, we'll be looking for MIAs in, uh, in Korea remains that were left there during the Korean War. And uh, so he, he had a call from his commander while he was home. He said, as soon as you get back, you're going to pre uh, prepare to deploy to, uh, uh, to Korea, North Korea. And I said, what? North Korea? It's not a friendly country. <laughs> and uh, so he said, yeah, we go there. Uh, they know we're there, but we don't have any equipment, anything that we can take in, or weapons or anything. He said, we go there to, and look for places been reported that there's MIA, possible MIA's remains there. So, uh, unfortunately, when they got there, um, they had been there like three days and when 9-11 happened. So they were kind of stuck there because they wouldn't wouldn't let them leave, and uh, they were just playing tricks on their mind and trying to tell them that um, America was under attack, and 
and they were to stay there until they were allowed to leave. So the, he said that we never saw him again after that, but he told us how they had uh, um, the tension between them and the North Koreans were got worse and worse every day. And eventually they came home with uh, 14 sets of remains of North uh, American soldiers. And uh, they were, they had these 14 sets of remains and the, the, they were uh, patri de uh, patriotized. Um, repatriated. Re repatriated, that's a big word for me. <laughs> but um, uh, they, they went through uh, Hawaii and came home and then they immediately started preparing to deploy to uh, Afghanistan. So. So when did Brian deploy to Afghanistan? Well, after he came home from uh, North Korea, his unit was deployed and they ended up in uh, several different countries there before they went in to Afghanistan, but he was he was assigned to the 19th Special Forces, supporting them in their EOD. <coughs> did, he, did he deploy 2001? No. Was it 2001? 2001. Was it 2001 yeah. so deployed? It was just, um, a couple months after. Not yeah. 11. But he. So, so he deployed, and he was with that Special Forces group. He went to Uzbekistan first. And I was there as well. Yeah. So we, oh, okay. We were there at the same time, yeah. same place, actually. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was. Uh, so he he deployed, and then he uh, he started doing his EOD work in Afghanistan after that. Right. Yeah. He was uh, with the 19th Special Forces, and they were staying in a old house downtown uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Afghanistan. 17th. Yeah, he, well, he was with the 710th EOD, but he was um, with this the 19th Special Forces downtown, giving them EOD support. He would go out with them every day, and they would put their trust in Brian and his partner to, to make these things safe to handle, and then they would blow it up or whatever they had to do. <clears throat> but um, actually, before that, he he was in. He spent eight months in uh, where? <laughs> uh, Bosnia. Bosnia, doing EOD work there. <coughs> but uh, he uh, he was going out every day, and and uh, they were uh, clearing an area called Ammo Alley, where Bin Laden um, deposited a lot of his stuff that. And they were going out blowing this stuff up, and and uh, they suspected that they were being watched, and uh, they uh, were clearing this area uh, and blowing stuff up, and just living their dream, you know, of doing what they w went there for, and uh, so they uh, uh, worked there f for a while, and uh, the then it was in like 2002 when he was killed. Right? 2002, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, he was. They one day they went out, and it was five of the guys working there together, and they they were in an old creek bed, and they were taking out these uh, 105 millimeter uh, Chinese-made rockets that were left there, and they were stacking them to blow them up, and uh, the Taliban had been watching them and guarding that place and somehow they uh, they booby trapped the uh, and put uh, booby traps in the tips of these rockets and uh, they they had a guide or with them or somebody was was with them but they uh, had put these uh, things in, in the tips of these rockets and and set it off by remote control so you know they could have been in New York City and set it off with a uh, phone, cell phone, but uh, they. Where were you when you got the news? Well, 
we knew, you know, what was going on in those parts of the world. And so we felt really calm and secure that he would be all right. He was okay. Uh, he did say that, uh, you know, they, they never knew where they would be going from one day to another. But uh, I was uh, here in Houston and we were uh, doing our pastoral duties and, and, and with the deaf people in First Baptist Church, Houston, and uh, doing this work every day. And I was working in the prison ministry and in uh, the county jail visiting the deaf people. And so we were just, you know, glad that they were kind of separated out of the the danger zones, uh, you know, if you, as much as you can be in a situation like that. And uh, I was uh, getting ready to carry a mission team overseas to, uh, to uh, uh, where were we going? Ukraine. Oh, to Ukraine. I was, yeah, we had had a mission there for a while in Ukraine. And uh, so we were taking a group there and, and we were getting ready to leave that afternoon. <clears throat> and uh, uh, that morning about 7.30, I was getting my team together and, and we were gonna meet at uh, the airport. And uh, it was about 7, 7.30 in the morning that I got a call from one of my church members. And he said, have you seen on the news what happened in Afghanistan this morning in, in Kandahar? And I said, no, and I didn't think a whole lot about it because um, that kind of thing was happening almost daily. And, and Brian would always call us and, and say, hey, you know, he said, I don't know if you've seen what happened in, in Kandahar th this morning, but, um, you know, th there was an explosion and uh, several people, we reports are that several people were killed. And, but I didn't really think that much about it because we were getting those kind of re phone calls um, very often and uh, so we kept calling and trying to get in touch with some of his team members and his commander and different people to find out exactly what had happened but couldn't get in touch with anybody so lo the longer the time went on that morning we we felt that Brian had been involved in this explosion in some way because nobody would tell us anything and uh, so it, my wife um, was working at uh, Champion Forest Baptist Church uh, in the records office there, and she had some work she had to get done. And so we talked, we prayed for these, whoever it was involved in this um, explosion, that they were okay and praying for their families and praying for our family that we'd be okay. So, and, but I had to go ahead and get ready to leave because my plane was leaving about four o'clock that afternoon. And uh, so uh, my wife, Barbara, came home uh, at lunchtime and she had a real bad headache from trying to talk to people and find out what was going on. Because by that time we knew that something bad had happened and, uh, but nobody would tell us anything. And uh, so she took me to the airport with my bags and everything because I had a team of about 10 people going, to, going with me and uh, <laughs> so she got in the car and we were backing out of the driveway and she, uh, she said, Arthur, if, if Brian has been killed, how will, <laughs> how will the army let us know? And I was trying to be smart aleck and I said, well, I, said, I know, I don't know, but in the movies they send two guys to the two officers to your to the house to tell you and so we drove uh, to the airport and she let me off and I said I'm not leaving until I find out that he is okay and so she went back home and she lay down on the couch in the living room and I kept calling she kept calling if we'd heard anything and and um, we were getting bits and pieces of information that several people had been killed and, and we knew where Brian was and what he was doing and a good chance that, that he could have been involved in this explosion. And uh, so uh, 
I guess it was uh, it's about 30 minutes before we were. It was time for us to to board the airplane and had not heard anything for sure what happened. And uh, uh, she called in, in, in a calm voice. She said, <laughs> "Brown has been killed." I can't imagine anything um, harder for a military family than to get that news. Um, so sorry. Thank you. But um, Brian left a, a, a legacy behind, and um, you didn't realize really what was going on because um, in the testimony I've read, you didn't know where he was spiritually because right. you know you've been encouraging him to serve the Lord, but you just didn't mm -hmm. know. And then um, you got a letter from him that I, I'm going to read. But also something else happened at the prison ministry because even though this had happened, you continued to minister. Mm -hmm. and, and you went to the prison. And, and what happened at the prison? Well, we were at that time ministering to about 50 deaf men that were in prison. And uh, I knew most of them personally, you know, that I had talked with and met with and ministered to. But uh, that night, particular night, and. Uh, after Brian had been killed, I went back to the prison, and uh, uh, as I, the prisoner was lined up, they had their passes to go into the prison, into the ministry, to the prison ministry uh, for chapel. And um, there's one man particularly that I saw up in the front of the line that I didn't really know that well, but uh, he got my attention. He said, "Come here, come here." And I said, I can't, you know, just wait. And he said, no, come here, hurry. So he uh, got out of line. I, th I called him out of line and to talk to him. I said, what's going on? And he said, uh, he said, I have to tell you about a dream I had. And this guy had not really professed to me to be a Christian. or But uh, he, that night he really wanted to talk about Brian. And so he, I said, what's going on? And he said, uh, well, last night I had a dream about Brian. I said, you did? What was the dream? So he started uh, telling me, he said, uh, I saw Brian in heaven standing, standing beside Jesus. And Jesus was, was really, really tall. And he had and, no idea of the circumstances. I, no. Mm -mm. And he had, well, he had his arm around him. Well, I'm going to read this letter um, that, that Brian sent you and that this is this is amazing because this letter arrived was it 12 days after he was killed yeah. after he you know, 12 days after his death and understand he had not been um, buried at that time because they postponed the cemetery I mean graveyard and everything at Arlington because the area where they were recovering the remains was was still hot, you know, it had a lot of unexploded ordnance and, and they were, cause, so they couldn't do anything, they couldn't have a funeral, so we put it off. Actually, I think it was 21 days before we were able to, to have a funeral. But 12 days afterwards, you received his last letter to you, and I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Yeah. Um, it says, Dear Dad, you've asked about my walk with Christ on the phone. I wanted to write and let you know how things are going. I just started the book you sent, The Four Pillars of a Man's Heart. It seems though every book that you send is an answer to my prayers. God has really blessed me with both a great father and mother. I am so fortunate to have two people that I can always come to for advice. Thank you. It is strange that of all my experiences in life that here in Afghanistan I've really started to grow spiritually. The Bible study that I was having with a group of guys before was an answered prayer. When I come home I will start to look for a weekly Bible study. I realize how important it is. I also realize how important prayer is. The book Fresh Wind Fresh Fire was great. I have my good days, I have my bad days. I guess that's to be expected. 
I will do so good for a couple of days and then falter. I know as I continue to grow in the Lord that my good days will outnumber my bad. I know that you pray for me and I thank you. Just know that God has answered your prayers concerning me. I never thought that I could grow in my relationship with God around people that I work with. I read in one of the books, as Christians, we know there are a hole, there, there is a hole, we just don't know how deep it goes. I want, I want you to know how deep it goes, or I want to know how deep it goes. I don't know if I said that right, but you know what I mean. My life is changing and I like it. I think that the guys that I work with know that I am different. I just pray that I make a difference in their lives. I pray that I am a good example. Pray for me that I may be a good example of a man of Christ. Pray that I make the right decisions, say the right things, act the way that I should as a Christian. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for being the great parent you are. And thank you for all that you do for me. Thank you for being a role model. Thank you for being not only parents, but great friends. I love you and mom so much. Love, Brian. That was the strangest experience to receive a letter from someone that you knew had already passed away and was, but this was a gift from God. It was. Yeah. To assure us that, that he was okay, that he was with the Lord. And, you know, we made a decision early on that uh, we had a choice to either be bitter and withdraw or either to thank God for Brian and the 27 years that we had with him uh, and celebrate his life. As we found out if we were, got bitter and we withdrew, the whole, it was like a darkness just came around us. But if we just celebrated his life and uh, thank God for that gift of 27 years, that everything changed. We could, we could go on and we could, we could live and and we cannot i'm writing a book someday but uh, but there's i cannot begin to express all of the experiences that we've had that things that have happened and this letter has been read in over a hundred churches and uh, and but, but this this it goes on and on day after day no matter where we go or what we do. Um, my wife has been impressed by the way people that met Brian, and we get letters from people that we don't know, and is, and we'll be parked in a parking lot at Walmart. <laughs> people will come. Around the truck, you, you had Brian's Around truck. Around the truck? Wrapped. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was, mm -hmm. it's beautiful, and I'm gonna put a picture of the truck up. Oh, the okay, the yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is the whole story within itself, itself. of how Brian's truck, the Freedom Truck, we named the it. Freedom Truck. Okay, well, sir, um, we thought we would bring in your wife and um, your daughter. Good choice. Good choice. <laughs> and I know, uh, I know your wife died shortly after um, Brian's death and that was that was hard because you lost Brian then shortly after you uh, you uh, lost your wife but you remarried mm -hmm. God gave you another wife and, beautiful uh, um, tell us about um, how you two met uh -oh. Wow <laughs> <laughs> well um, we met at church we both worked for Houston's First Baptist Church Arthur was at a different campus uh, with the deaf church. I worked in the pastoral care office. And so occasionally uh, I would need a minister to go minister to a family. And if all the ministers at the big church, we called it, 
was busy, uh, I had a friend that said, well, why don't you call Arthur Craig? I bet he would help. So that's kind of how we got started because then he was my go-to person when I needed another minister to minister to a family. So, um, so yeah, and I would call him and he'd say, I'd say, would you be available to minister to this family? And he would always, always say, I would be honored to be with that family. So that really touched me. So you got to know Brian through the stories. And, and yes. that's neat because I want you to talk about um, the organization that you guys are involved with. In. Okay. Well, um, I'll get to know Brian when I get to heaven. Um, and so I'm excited about that because I have a lot of questions. No, <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> But um, through uh, the military, uh, and Arthur was in, uh, he and Barbara had been involved with the uh, EOD family. Uh, that's Explosive Ordnance Disposal, for those who are not familiar with EOD. It's a special group of military men from all the forces that take care of us and keep us free. And so, um, through the EOD family and uh, the events they have once a year, and then um, they have a uh, memorial every year. Uh, it's the, the Warrior Wall, and they add names to the wall, and we uh, are with other families that uh, have lost a loved one. It's this really special, sweet time. And um, so that's kind of my first introduction but after that, we had the opportunity to go to several events that would uh, that they have throughout the year for the EOD families and uh, siblings. And uh, Gold Star. Uh, we went to for the Gold Star families. They would um, have events like uh, they took us to California one year on a uh, and it's for therapy for healing for the families together and to heal with other. EOD families that are going through the same thing and so it's it's an awesome incredible group of people that are in charge but also the people that we have got to know through the through that group and I think we've been to eight EOD events and uh and you started to meet people that knew Brian then as well yes yes that was a that was one of the things that uh, I every year I come back with this incredible uh, gift that someone at the event, they have several events, they have golf course, they uh, have an uh, auction, and um, so through one of the events, a, some person in the room of about 2,000 people will come up to Arthur and say, I worked with Brian in San Diego or uh, in Afghanistan or wherever, and they always have just incredible things to adventures and uh, he was a leader he was uh, a motivator he was giving he was just a wonderful person and we get that every year someone will come up to us and talk about Brian and it's awesome that is that is amazing um, so I we were talking the other day Elaine and, Al, mm -hmm. and you said that uh, you know, you got a call from from your mom. That must have been, I can't imagine how hard that was. Yeah. Um, so April 15, 2002, I woke up and um, I saw on the ticker that four soldiers had been killed in Afghanistan and like my heart sunk. But at the same time, I never could have imagined it would have been Brian because I was, I thought, well, he's not in the middle of all the action he's there to save lives by disarming these bombs and so but i called mom and dad and um they're like we haven't heard anything and they said that's you know um we always heard so if something happened over there like dad was sharing if something happened over there brian would call right away as soon as he could just to let us know that um he was okay and so um you know i just kept calling and calling home um and uh, they were like, we haven't heard anything. And uh, 
then I called one more time in the afternoon and it was actually um, my neighbor who answered the phone um, and she said Elaine and I she said the army is here and all I could say was Brian <laughs> and she said yes and I just remember dropping to my knees I want to thank you guys for sharing. It's, um, it's important that people hear these stories, but also that they hear the life after this because you're now doing something amazing. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, uh, I now serve with an organization called Project Love One, and we, um, we share the gospel. We uh, fulfill the Great Commission by doing community development in Eswatini, Africa. And uh, so we do water, uh, clean water initiatives, sanitation, hygiene, education, um, agricultural programs to address the, um, the poverty, the overwhelming poverty in a very rural area. We'll put your organization on the, on the bottom so people can see it. Thank, see you. thank you. I just want to thank you all um, for coming today. And, thank you. Um, I want to thank you for sharing the story. And uh, I want to thank you for Brian's service. Uh, but mm -hmm. most of all, I want to thank you for carrying on his legacy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.